Live from Boston, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM Chief Data Officer Summit. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of the IBM CDO Summit here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, and I'm joined with my co-host, Paul Gillen. We have a guest today, John Thomas. He is the Distinguished Engineer and Director at IBM. Thank you so much for coming, returning to theCUBE. You're a CUBE veteran, CUBE oh, alum. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> thank you for having me on this. Yep. So tell our viewers a little bit about your Distinguished Engineer. There are only 672 in all of IBM. What do you do? What is your role? Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Distinguished engineer is kind of a technical executive role, which is um, a combination of applying deep technology skills as well as uh, helping shape IBM strategy in, in, in a technical way, uh, working with clients, etc. Right. Um, so it is it is a bit of a jack of all trades, but also deep skills in in some specific areas. Um, and I love what I do. <laughs> so uh, we get to work with some very um, talented people, brilliant people in terms of shaping IBM technology and strategy, product strategy that is uh, part of it. We also work very uh, closely with clients in terms of how to apply that technology in the context of the client's use cases. We've heard a lot today about soft skills, the importance of organizational people skills to being a successful chief data officer, but there's still a technical component. How important is the technical side? What is? What are the technical skills that the CDOs need? Oh, this is a very good question, Paul. So absolutely, so um, navigating the organizational structure is important, it's a soft skill, you're absolutely right. Uh, and being able to understand the business strategy for the company and then aligning your data strategy to the business strategy is important, right? But the underlying technical pieces need to be solid. So for example, how do you deal with large volumes of different types of data spread across the company? How do you manage that data? How do you understand the data? How do you govern that data? Um, how do you um, then um, start leveraging the value of the data in the context of your business, right? So an understand, deep understanding of the technology of collecting, organizing, and analyzing that data is needed for you to be a successful CDO. So in terms, of, in terms of those skill sets that you're looking for, and one of the things that Interpol said earlier in his keynote is that there are just, it's, a, it's a rare individual who truly understands the idea of how to collect, store, analyze, securitize, monetize the data, yeah. and then also has the, the soft skills of yeah. being able to navigate the organization, being able to be a change agent yeah. who is Im inspiring, yeah. uh, inspiring the rank and file. Yeah. How do you recruit and retain talent? I yeah. mean, this seems to be a, a major challenge. Expertise is, you know, getting the right expertise in place, and Indra Paul talked about it um, in his keynote, which was the very first thing uh, he did was bring in talent. Sometimes it is from outside your company. Maybe you have talent that has grown up in your company. Maybe you have to go outside, but you got to bring in the right skills together, form the team that understands the technology and the business side of things and build this team. And that is essential for you to be a successful CDO. And to some extent, um, that's what Interpol has done, that's what the analytics CDO's office has done. Um, Seth Dobrin, my boss, uh, is the analytics CDO. And uh, he um, and uh, the analytics CDO team actually uh, hired people with different skills, data engineering skills, data science skills, uh, visualization skills, and then put this team together which understands the how to collect, govern, curate, and analyze the data, and then apply them in specific situations. So. A lot of talk about uh, AI at this conference, which seems to be finally happening. Um, what do you see in the field, or perhaps projects that you've worked on, of examples of, of AI that are really having a meaningful business uh, yeah. Uh, impact? Yeah, Paul, it's a very good question because you know uh, the term AI is overused a lot, as you can imagine, a lot of hype around it. But I think we are past that hype cycle and people are looking at how do I implement successful use cases? And I stress the, the word use case, right? Uh, in my experience, these, how I'm going to transform my business in one big boil the ocean exercise does not work. Um, but if you have a very specific bounded use case that you can identify, the business tells you this is relevant, uh, the business tells you what the metrics for success are, and then you focus your, uh, your attention, your, your efforts on that specific use case with the skills needed for that use case, then it's successful. So, you know, examples of use cases from across the industries, right? I mean, everything that you can think of, customer-facing examples like 
uh, how do I read the customer's mind? So when, uh, when, if I'm a business and I interact with my customers, can I anticipate what the customer is looking for? Maybe for a cross-sell opportunity, or maybe to reduce the call handling time when a customer calls into my call center, um, or um, trying to uh, segment my customer so I can do a proper promotion or a campaign for that customer. All of these are specific customer-facing examples. There are also examples of applying this internally to improve processes, capacity planning for your infrastructure. Can I predict when a system is likely to have an outage? And, uh, or uh, can I predict the traffic coming into my systems, into my uh, infrastructure and provision capacity for that on demand? So all of these are interesting applications of, uh, of AI in the enterprise. So when you're trying, I mean, one of the things we keep hearing is that we need data to tell a story. Yeah. That data needs to, the data needs to be compelling enough so that the, the people, the data scientists get it, but yeah. then also the, the other kinds of business decision makers get it too. Yeah. So what are sort of the best practices that have emerged from your experience in terms of being able to, for, for your data to tell the story that you want it to tell? Yeah, well, I mean, if the pattern doesn't exist in the data, then no amount of fancy algorithms can help, you know? So, um, and sometimes it's like searching for a needle in a haystack, but um, assuming, uh, so the, the, I guess the first step is like I said, what is your use case? Once you have a clear understanding of your use case and success metrics for that use case, do you have the data to support that use case? So for example, if it's fraud detection, do you actually have the historical data to support the fraud use case? Sometimes you may have transactional data from your um, uh, your transaction data from your core enterprise systems, but that may not be enough. You may need to augment it with external data, third-party data, maybe unstructured data that goes along with your transaction data. So, question is, can you identify the data that is needed to support the use case? And if so, can I do? Is that data clean? Is that is that data? Do you understand? the lineage of the data, who has touched and modified the data, who owns the data, so that I can then start building predictive models and machine learning, deep learning models with that data. Right? So use case, do you have the data to support the use case? Do you understand how the data reached you? Then comes the process of you know, applying machine learning algorithms and deep learning algorithms against that data. Well, one of the risks of machine learning, and particularly deep learning, I think, is it becomes kind of a black box, yeah. and people can fall into the trap of just believing what yeah. comes back, regardless of whether the algorithms are really sound or the data is sound. What is, what is the responsibility of data scientists to sort of show their work? Yeah, Paul, this is a fascinating and uh, not completely solved area, right? So, uh, bias detection. Can I explain how my model behaved? Um, can I ensure that the models are fair in, in, in their predictions? Um, so there is a lot of research, a lot of innovation happening in this space. Uh, IBM is investing um, a lot in this space. Um, we call trust and transparency. Uh, being able to explain um, a model it, it, it's got multiple levels to it. Um, you need some level of AI governance itself. So just like we talked about data governance, there is the notion of AI governance, which is what version of the model was used to make a prediction. What were the inputs that went into that model? What were the decisions that were, that, what were the features that were used to make a certain prediction? What was the prediction? And how did that match up with ground truth? You need to be able to capture all of that information. But beyond that, we have got um, uh, actual mechanisms in place that IBM Research is developing to look at uh, bias detection. Um, so pre-processing, during execution, post-processing, can I look for bias in how my models behave? And do I have mechanisms to mitigate that? So one example is the open source Python library called AIF360 that comes from IBM's research and is contributed to the open source community. Um, you can look at, there are mechanisms to look at um, bias and, and, and uh, uh, provide some level of um, uh, bias mitigation as part of your model building exercises. And is the bias mitigation, does it have to do with, and I'm going to use an IBM term of art here, the human in the loop? I mean, is, is, is how much are you actually looking at the humans that are part of this process? Yeah, humans are, def at least at this point in time, humans are very much in the loop. This, this notion of pure AI where humans are uh, completely outside the loop is, uh, we are not there yet. So very much something that the system, can it provide a set of uh, recommendations, can it provide a set of explanations, and can someone who understands the business look at it and make uh, corrective, take corrective action as needed.
There has so. been, uh, however, to, to Rebecca's point, uh, some prominent people, including Bill Gates, who have, have speculated that AI could ultimately be uh, a negative for humans. Uh, what is the responsibility of, of, of companies like IBM to ensure that humans are kept in the loop? I think um, at least at this point, IBM's view is humans are an essential part of AI. Right? In fact, we don't even use the term artificial intelligence that much. We call it augmented intelligence, where the system is presenting a set of recommendations, uh, expert advice to the human who can then make a decision. So for example, you know, my team worked with um, uh, a prominent um, healthcare uh, provider uh, on um, you know, models for predicting patient de death in, uh, in the case of sepsis, uh, sepsis onset. This is, we are talking literally life and death decisions being made. And this is not something that you can just automate and throw it into a magic black box and, and have a decision be made, right? So this is absolutely a place where people with deep domain knowledge are supported, are augmented with, um, with uh, AI uh, to make better decisions. That's where, that's where I think we are today. As to what will happen five years from now, <laughs> I can't predict that yet. Well, I actually want to bring this question. up to both of you. you know, the role, so you are helping doctors make these decisions, yeah. not just this is what the computer program says about yeah. this patient's yeah. symptoms here, but this is really, um, so you're helping the doctor make better decisions. What about the doctor's gut and the, his, intu his or her intuition yeah. too? Yeah. I mean, what is, what is the role of that well, in the future? Uh, 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 I, I think it goes away. I mean, I think the intuition really will be trumped by data in the long term because you can't argue with the facts, uh, much as some some people do these days. The um, but I don't know. I'm interested. <laughs> no comments there about that. Uh, interested in, in your in your perspective on, on that? Uh, is there? Will there always? Should there always be a human on the front lines who is being supported by the back end? Or would, would you see a scenario where an AI is making decisions, customer-facing decisions, that are really are life and death decisions? So I think in the consumer industry, I can definitely see AI making decisions on its own, right? So, you know, if, if um, let's say, um, a recommender system which right. says, you know, I think, you know, you know, John Thomas bought these last five things online. He's likely to buy this other thing. Let's make an offer to him. You know, I don't need a human in the loop for that. No right? harm, right? Right. right. It's, 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 it's pretty straightforward. It's already happening um, in a big way. Um, but when it comes to some of these... Proving a mortgage. Yeah. How about that one? That's yeah. Where bias death, creeps in a lot. Yeah. 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 And even that, I think, can be, can be automated. Can be automated if the thresholds are set to be what the business is comfortable with, where it says, okay, above this probability level, I don't really need a human to look at this. Mm -hmm. But, and if it is below this level, I do want someone to look at mm -hmm. this. That's, you know, that is relatively straightforward, right? But if it is a decision about, um, you know, life or death situations, or something that affects the, the very fabric of the business that you are in, then you probably want a domain expert to look at it. And most enterprises, enterprise use cases will fall, lean towards that category. These are big questions. These yes. are hard questions. These are hard questions. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, John, thank you so much for oh, coming absolutely. on thank the Cube. You. We've really had a great time with you. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Paul Gillen. We will have more from the Cube's live coverage of IBM CDO here in Boston just after this.